we are now live here on our YouTube channel. It's our daily show we call the Halftime Report, uh, where we go through these markets one step at a time, top-down analysis style, looking at the indexes, the sectors, industries, individual companies, economic data, anything uh, relevant and pertinent to the financial markets that day, give you guys our analysis and insight so you can better run your daily routine. And welcome back uh, to Tackle Trading. Uh, if you're a veteran of the community, you know what I'm going to ask right now. Hashtag Team Tackle right in the chat. Let's get the conversation started as we always do. And it's the last day of the quarter, guys, uh, the end of June here today. And the markets had a pretty good quarter, pretty good first uh, two quarters of the year. We'll take a look at what's going on across the markets here today on a Wednesday as well. Uh, i got a full panel of coaches here today. i got Coach Tyler for his Wednesday appearance back. And we're going to have another round of Jedi options a little bit later in the show, highlighting a company from the solar industry, a couple of different ways Tyler has drum up on how to play that. Tyler, how are you doing today, sir? Good. You know, you know the thought that came into my mind in, in this opening is I was thinking about the Russell 2000 and I'm like, I'm just waiting for this thing to break out so I can spike the football on uh, <laughs> good old Greg. Holmes, he's been talking trash about uh, your read on this for a while. He's got it range up. He, he will not stop talking about it. In fact, yesterday during the show, he's like, I wish Tyler was here so that I could spike the football <laughs> on how it's head and, he hitting his head on resistance. So there's a good old fashioned uh, little battle going between you and him right now on the Russell. I'm still seeing the lean on bullish. It's not quite yet. Uh, Maddie, how are you doing today on a Wednesday? I'm doing fantastic. I'm excited to be here. I, I don't think I'm doing as good as the Sox index, though. I'm excited to have Tyler break that down from a technical perspective because that's looking saucy. Um, the Russell 2000. I'm gonna have to. Uh, I'm gonna have to side with Tyler here. I, I, as long as the Russell 2000 continually increases uh, that short-term support level, that breakout is lining up pretty good, in my opinion. Dude, the Sox is looking saucy right now. There's no doubt about it. Semis are waking up. They are waking up. We're going to take a look at that here in just a bit. Cody as well, though. I'm not going to let him get the saucy in, Cody, without me saying saucy three more times. Uh, we're, this is a little inside baseball. Cody oh Mackey. My God. <laughs> I'm my, loving it. <laughs> how are you doing there, young man? How is everyone doing? Uh, yeah, uh, the word saucy was used before the show, and I was like, y'all going to use that live? And I'm, I'm glad we keep saying saucy over and over. <laughs> yeah, no, Look, the, the markets are regretting. looking pretty saucy right now. I'm regretting this whole thing at this moment. Now we're going to get right yeah. into the analysis. <laughs> it was it was funny. Now it's not. Now it's just weird. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all right. Uh, let's get down to market analysis here today, guys. Like I said, yeah. end of the quarter. And uh, you know, start with the S&P 500 here, Tyler. This is what, five, six days in a row that we've you know been moving higher, marching higher. In fact, I've been writing the print in the huddle each and every day. Stocks edge higher, stocks narrowly rise, but they continue to hit all time highs here in a very bullish overall market. Uh, the S&P now closing the first half of the year up, what, like 16, 15%. I'll get the final exact number here in just a minute. But Tyler, we've been bullish, looking really good. Uh, what you read on the market though, is it's hesitating up here. Yeah, I think uh, growth in the NASDAQ have really taken over. Uh, the S&P you're not mad at it. It's like, look, I, I was actually impressed by how much the market's gone up. I, you, you get, you, you succumb to recency bias and it's like, we're just kind of gradually moving up, but over time, gradually moving up, scratching out, you know, quarter percent up, 10th of 1% up. It, it adds up. It adds up. And, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm liking how we're stacking gains here, but short term, it's fine. I mean, the S and P is not really overbought. It's just gradually moving. It's the middle of summer. Uh, I don't honestly see too much to, to uh, discuss other than just path of least resistance remains higher. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, the path of least resistance in an upward trend is usually going to be higher. I mean, right, a trend is a trend for a reason. We say that uh, so many different ways in the marketplaces. Uh, and Matt, uh, obviously, the bullishness has been intact. The S&P always has that broad-based feel to it because it's different industries, different sectors. Tech has had a real good run here lately. We'll look at that here in just a minute. Uh, but really today, I mean, I'm seeing energy pop back up and still the S&P just kind of chugging along. Uh, what's your read on the market here, Matt? I, th I think the stories were... <clears throat> the story that I'm, I'm personally looking at is the longer term story on those weekly charts right now. 
Uh, the daily charts, you know, do look a little bit overextended in the S&P. You, you do like that quarter point, quarter point, quarter point, but it does create a little bit of a fade action on that on that daily chart where you don't have a great trigger. Um, but on the weekly charts, I think is where this story is going to be told, especially as we start coming into the, you know, this is the last trading day of the uh, first half of the year, the, the second quarter here. As we start preparing for that back half of the year, that you know third and fourth quarter, um, I love where this market is. No, first and foremost, we've had an amazing first half of the year, an amazing first half of the year, one of the best first half of the year from a pure price perspective in the in in the S and P in the last 20 years. And from that perspective, over the course of the last two months in the market, you've had consolidation in the broad markets. So you have one of the better first halves of the year. And going into the second half of the year, you got good patterns on those weekly charts. And you're now just starting to break out out of consolidation on those weekly charts. I think that looks extremely healthy for the back half of the year. And when you look at some of those other years that we've had really robust price action coming into the first half of the year, like in 2013, like in 2014, like in 2017, you saw continuation in those environments. You saw the back half of the year continue the strength that the first half of the year made. But unlike some of those times, you didn't have great technical patterns going into that second half, in, in, in my opinion, like you do right now on that weekly chart. And so I love where this market is, and I love the breakouts that we're seeing on those long-term charts right now as well. I think mm -hmm. the back half looks pretty good. I agree. I agree. You know, and, and we were talking about that pre-show about how the performance this year has been so strong. And uh, I, Matt, until I read that statistic and we started having a conversation, I didn't realize we were having such a good year relative to recent history. Uh, best uh, first half of the year in a couple of decades here, Tyler. And so we went back and we looked at a lot of the trends that have been intact during other years that were really good years. And I understand the instinct by uh, a value investor or somebody who's just naturally cautious, say markets are way up. They got to go back down, right? Or they got to stall or they got to do this. They don't have to do that. In fact, Tyler, you're kind of highlighting some of the stronger trends in different years that Matt uh, identified as well. 2012, 13 had a, a good year as well. 15, 16, uh, those type of years. Uh, Tyler, what, what did, are you seeing here in the S&P 500, the strength this year compared to other years that uh, you've identified? Yeah. It, so I put 2013, 2017, 2019. I mean, those, those were the three years that had really gangbuster starts for the first six months. And yeah, if you look, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist here. I mean, in, in, and this is a sample size of three, but whatever. I mean, that's, that's been the trend uh, that I think is worth, worth reading into. But in all three instances, uh, the trend continued. Uh, the, the strength at the first half of the year uh, did not really suggest, hey, batten down the hatches, it's gonna get nasty. Yeah, you're going to pause. You're going to settle. I mean, think about this year. You, you know, there's the sell in May and go away phrase that comes in. We really haven't seen much drama at all. Uh, you know, six, we're ending the six month in the first year. Oftentimes you will get some nastiness in May or, or, or June, but it's been pretty, pretty uh, benign, at least on the S&P 500. So I, I like, I like what the stats suggest when you look historically these last three times. Um, and we're not even getting into the fundamentals and what's going on in the economy and everything. It's just the price action. And it, and yeah, so I, I would say that the trend and the history, uh, gives you a green light. It makes you more optimistic with what's, what, what's going on this year. Well, and, and, and I don't want to, you know, dive into the fundamentals of every single one of the, those years, but I will add just a little bit of context to those years. It was in 2013 and 2014 where you had an extremely robust quantitative easing program that was driving the market theme. $85 billion a month coming into the market as that backdrop of security and that backstop to the traders was very, very, very important for those years and that continued price appreciation. 
And then in 17, you had the amazing, you know, uh, uh, the amazing robust tr uh, trading in 17. And that a lot of that was due to the tax plan that came out in 2017 that the Trump administration put out there. And that theme drove the market for the entire year. And you've you've had a very similar, you know, it might not be the $85 billion of quantitative easing, but now it's the $120 billion of quantitative easing. In 17, it was the tax plan. Right now, we don't have the tax plan, but we have massive, massive investment happening and, and expected continued investment happening from the government uh, from a fiscal law policy perspective, driving the markets as well. And so when you're looking at it, uh, when you're looking at a market that has had such a great start of the year, I think for a lot of traders are going to be like, well, this is overextended, 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 you know, the would and could and should I wish I would have been here in January type thing, right? We see that all the time, but the reality is in those other moments in time that we saw this type of robust price action in the first half of the year that was associated to some uh, macro theme, we saw that also continue in the back half. Will it continue in the back half? That's obviously an open question, but history has suggested in the past that it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's interesting at least uh, for us to look back at this history. I love this kind of stuff. It gives well, me and, some context, you know. And, and I just go back to that weekly chart right now. You look at that weekly chart on the S&P, you look at the weekly chart on the, on the Russell 2000, and, and quite frankly, you look at that weekly chart on the, on the SOX index, and I want to take a deep dive technically on that one as well. You're, ta you're talking about breakouts here, guys, breakouts mm -hmm. out of prolonged consolidation. And whereas, you know, uh, for last year, it was, the story of last year, the story of the last two years really wasn't the Microsofts and the Apples and those big names. Well, guys, guess what's waking up? Those big names are. Those big names of Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, you know, the remember when 2013, when when Kramer dubbed them the FANG mm -hmm. and that carried the market for literally five consecutive years. Those stocks are now waking up. I love this market right now. And I think the market, it, no, don't get me wrong. I, I have concerns from a fundamental perspective the same way a lot of people do. But from a price action perspective, from a theme perspective, this market looks looks ready to run again. Tyler, and I would love to hear a, a deep dive here on the SOX index because it's grabbing my attention. We highlighted it yesterday. In fact, uh, you know, I love the AMAP breakout. AMD is picking itself up. You start watching these individual components. You're like, okay, what's going on in the industry? And this uh, SOX, uh, you know, chart is looking like a beautiful longer term breakout uh, in the continuation of a multi, multi year trend. And we know how important semiconductors are to the market. Uh, so what are you seeing here, uh, Ty, uh, in the SOX? Yeah, I, I think the way that I would break this down is I would, on the index level, we tend to talk about the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000 index. The NASDAQ has been telling the story of, of growth stocks uh, come, making a comeback, right? I mean, if, if, you, if you remember when the market got nasty, it was growth stocks that got punched in February. And this, this whole thing, we had a pretty big correction in growth stocks. Uh, same thing in May, you had a pretty big sell-off in growth stocks. Well, look, when the NASDAQ is leading, I think that active traders, momentum traders, short-term traders, they prefer a market where growth is leading. Uh, it seems to be easier to trade, uh, certainly in my opinion, and I think that's shared by a lot of people. So you, you have the NASDAQ doing better than the S&P 500, doing better than the Russell 2000 index. It is a leading index. And so when you look in the NASDAQ and you say, well, what are the growth engines, right? What is fueling this? Semiconductors, I, I should go back and look at this at some point, but I would be very surprised if the NASDAQ is able to perform this well without semiconductors. Mm -hmm. uh, like when you look last year, you know, we had that major push in growth stocks the back half of the year after, you know, the pandemic bottom um, and semiconductors, right? Chip stocks did very, very well. So I, I think that you can make the connection that for the NASDAQ to look fantastic, you really want participation from semiconductors. Um, and, and we've certainly seen that. We've certainly seen that. Uh, and, and that's, I think, first of all, the context that I would keep in mind when I'm looking at the SOX uh, is no wonder that the NASDAQ looks good. And, and what should actually should excite you is the NASDAQ's already gone up for two straight weeks and chip stocks are only now breaking out, right? And so if you say, hey, what's going to keep the NASDAQ going up? 
I don't know. There's still a lot of really good looking tech stocks that, that don't look crazy extended. So with that in mind, then you look at the SOX index, which by the way, there's multiple ways to track this. Uh, we were talking about it pre-show. So SOX is officially the semiconductor index, uh, but there are ETFs that track this as well. And they all kind of paint a similar picture. So SOX is the index. Uh, SMH is the ETF that effectively tracks the index, but there's another one, SOXX. So you, you take your pick as to which product you want to use, but from a charting perspective, they're all painting a similar picture. Uh, and when you look at the weekly time frame, like this is what I'm talking about last year. And come on, th th this thing went from 1240 up to almost 3000, like forget it. I mean, if you want to know what area of the market was a very, very uh, big backer of the, the, the growth rebound, it was semiconductors. So look, they were hot coming into this year and they needed a breather. So you get a nice little sideways base, you get some digestion, you get some consolidation, uh, and now you're breaking out. And we've said before, the longer the base, the higher in space. When, when you get a breakout of a six month or a multi-month sideways trading range, you got gas in the tank. You know, it's like been building up energy and, and uh, you know, acquiring fuel for the last six months. And now you finally muster enough strength to break resistance. That's usually a breakout you want to bet on, right? We don't usually bet on these failing. We bet on these succeeding. Uh, and so that right there is kind of the excitement that these are just getting started. Uh, and that is why you're seeing uh, AMAT and Qualcomm and Texas Instruments and NVIDIA and AMD and Micron all looking pretty tasty here. Uh, you know, on, on their individual charts. Yeah, yeah, you're getting a lot of pickup uh, from different components in the industry. And obviously you got the leadership in NVIDIA and Marvel. Those two stocks have just been juggernauts as well. It's an interesting interesting one to watch. And I think you're right here, Tyler, just knowing my 16 year history in the market, it's very rare that I can think of uh, where tech is running and, and semis are not participating at some level. And usually they're the ones leading, right? Yep. Uh, they're such an important component uh, of the tech sector as well. Uh, Maddie, anything else you wanna add on uh, semiconductors here? Uh, while we're just looking at the longer term charts and this, I love that phrase, the longer the base, the higher in space. Uh, that's a I good do. One. I do love that one as well. Yeah. Um, no, the only thing I'd add to that, because uh, I'm looking at the same thing as Tyler is technically, and he's got a very good read technically on that, is uh, just simply the, the, the bond market and how the bond market has been associated to the growth. As long as that 10 year note stays underneath 1.5, mm -hmm. growth is going to be in favor. Yeah, I agree. Uh, anything else you got on, on, on stocks right now, Ty, before we move to commodities? No, I will I will piggyback off what, what Matt just said. Uh, if you want to know some intermarket dynamics that are maybe uh, favoring growth, you know, TNX is the 10-year yield. You, you are continuing to see interest rates go down, ironically. Uh, and to Matt's point, that is that is supportive of growth over value. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that yeah. So so Matt, so why wouldn't you? You got interest rates in a downtrend, favorite growth. You got semis breaking out. You kind of have these things lining up where it's it's pretty hard to bet against growth. It, yeah, and all of the, I mean, you got you love the chart in and of itself on what you're seeing in the Nasdaq, what you're seeing in in, in the growth areas of the market. I mean, even. Even when you look at the Russell 2000, the Russell 1000 value index in the quarter is up like four and a half percent. The Russell uh, 1000 growth index is up like 14.4 percent in the quarter. Mm -hmm. And so you have supporting intramarket analysis, supporting the growth. And, and typically when growth starts firing off, guys, it, it's the entire philosophy of the market the last 12 years. And I've said it multiple times in the last couple of weeks. When the market does get confused, it will bet on growth. Yeah. And it's been betting on growth and we're seeing that in the performances. That's interesting on the Russell 1000 value versus growth indexes, startling differences, 14 versus 4%. That's, that's a big number. And a lot of it is simply in the last three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move through the commodity market next here. And, uh, you know, crude light is where I always like to start. Uh, obviously, there's an OPEC meeting that was supposed to start tomorrow. Actually, they delayed it by a day. Apparently, they can't figure out what production cuts they do or do not want to make. So uh, we'll see if there are any headlines that come out of that. Until then, though, we're just anticipating the news. Uh, beautiful trend that is intact here, pushing towards a high. I, I just still see the same chart, guys. Uh, anything you're seeing, uh, Tyler, you want to highlight? It's pretty, man. It's consistent. And a uh, little bit of a pause is A-OK. -okay. It just it just ripped from 61 to 73. Let it let it chill out. I think 
I think you got to be impressed and, and uh, I don't know, your confidence bolstered every time that little dips get bought, right? Because you always wonder, you're like, are you guys still there? Are you dip buyers? Like, are you still <laughs> hanging around? And then it dips a day and they come right back. It's like, okay, just checking, just checking. So they're, you know, dip buyers still in force here. It's good. It's good. I like it. Uh, the uh, the uh, news that they delayed the meeting um, where they are expected to announce some degree of output increase mm -hmm. um, was a bullish catalyst, at least for today. Um, until Putin tells us to sell, I think we're still in bullish mentality, though. It's been bullish. Yeah, I think you got to maintain that until you get new information or a new chart mm -hmm. pattern. But uh, that's where I'm at as well. Uh, flash through the rest of them here, Ty. Uh, silver next. We'll, we'll talk gold here in a minute as well. But I actually liked uh, the little bounce in silver today. Tight consolidation right on that moving average. And if you'll notice, gold is also bouncing in a correlated way. They tend to move together. Uh, but Ty, what, are you seeing anything interesting here in silver? I'm my, probably way reading into it. I know it's way early. I'm not looking at a trade here. Uh, but I did like uh, the little forming, uh, you know, little base here uh, that's uh, developing. What, what are you seeing? A uh, couple of things. I mean, the first thing is it's not as if silver has been a great trading vehicle anyways, mm -hmm. uh, at least for me, it looks challenging. But look, I mean, if you want to pick it up on dips, I think anytime it sells off this much, you're interested. Um, I, you got to be impressed by the resilience. It is holding the 200 day moving average. It is holding support. Uh, yesterday was nasty. Um, and maybe you all should thank me because I did highlight the breakdown in gold in the tackle today. And I, it was the bottom, man. You're welcome. I, I should, <laughs> should fade me on those articles every time if you want. Uh, but I like it. You, you, you haven't broken resistance yet. So, so it's like bullish in the sense that it's going sideways and not down, but not bullish yet because it hasn't broken resistance. So you know, resistance breaks are always a little bit more resounding than, than going sideways. But yes, good start. Keep it up. Give me an upside breakout and we'll, we'll talk. Yeah. What about gold here, Ty? They, they do have subtle uh, differences, obviously. I mean, silver held up much better, but gold's trying to find a little, little bit of support down here. I know it's got a long ways to go uh, before you can start calling that, but uh, nice little price response on one day. Uh, what are you seeing here in gold? It is nice. It is nice. Um, I mean, again, when I, if you look, if you took a screenshot, which you can go to the tackle today and see it, but you know, just imagine we're yesterday and we're talking in the morning when this thing is a big red bar. And, and uh, admittedly, it hadn't broken 1750, but whatever. It, it, it had probed below the prior pivot. Looks like a bear flag breaking down. Wasn't a good look. Wasn't a good look. Um, and gold maybe got a little mad, right? Everybody was like, gold, you, you look terrible right now. It's got its act together. Looking a little better today. Just an inside candle, so hard to like, like, overemphasize this but I, I gotta admit it looks a lot better now than it did yesterday morning so uh you need a breakout to really get excited but just like silver stability is better than breaking support and, and plumbing the depths here so uh so far so good yeah i agree i agree uh all right uh let's move into the dollar next and lastly bitcoin i got a couple of different corporate items then uh tyler's actually going to be holding another round of the jedi option segment which is one of my favorite each and every week where he's going to be taking a look at csiq a stock from our tackle 25 two different ways to play it in the options market and solar's been picking up here recently so i think it's a really really good choice to, to at least highlight and analyze uh dollar obviously rallying here today one thing i liked about the gold move today matt was the dollars up and gold's up so yeah. At least for one day now, they're bucking that old uh, inverted correlation they have. This is a tough, tough chart uh, in my estimation because of my opinions about the long-term view of the dollar race to the bottom. But you got to at least be impressed with the higher pivot low here, Matt. Uh, dollar bullish at this point? Uh, what you read? Yeah, I do think you have to be slightly bullish in the short term. That's a confirmed increasing uh, support level where it did double dip against the 90 EMA. Uh, the 200-day the moving average is right there playing a little bit of a additional support as well. And then you have, the, at least today, you're looking at a potential breakout against the short-term resistance level at 20, uh, 2485, which should see some continued pressure up until the 25 range. And that was on the backs of some fairly uh, positive economic data today with the ADP non-farm rule. Employment change coming in uh, better than the expectation, as well as the uh, pending uh, home sales coming in uh, uh, much, much better than what the expectation was. And so typically, economic improvement 
dollar improves in that environment as well. And so, yeah, I do think you have to be at least slightly bullish. The, the intermediate charts, the longer term charts, I still look at them as uh, net neutrality. But in the short term, I, I am looking at it as a slightly bullish ranking on the dollar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to in the short term. And I read that ADP report actually on employment because we got the big uh, monthly jobs report on Friday. ADP always does theirs uh, the Wednesday before that report. And uh, Matt, a lot of gains in leisure and hospitality, 600,000 plus job gains, more than they expected, although down from the previous month, pretty strong, robust jobs report. And one thing that grabbed my attention as well, small companies of, you know, employees less than 15, as well as mid-sized companies and large companies all were hiring at about the same paces. So yep. yeah, pretty good report uh, out of ADP and that's going to strengthen uh, on the currency as it, well. It, and, and it's most likely leading into the Friday report as well, but that's going to be an important economic data. Yeah. Yeah. And Chicago PMI, by the way, still a very, very strong reading today as well. So a little bit of economic data supporting the dollar in the short term. Yep. All right. Uh, lastly, uh, Bitcoin, if we can here, Tyler, uh, BTC. And, uh, you know, obviously we're still in the box and uh, between anywhere between 29,000 and 41,000, in my opinion, is that box. Uh, Tyler hesitating after a nice little bounce reprieve type of situation over a few days. Uh, what you read here on Bitcoin on the chart? You know, I did. I, I will say this. I didn't watch the whole halftime report yesterday. But I did catch the piece where Coach Greg bought Bitcoin. And in light of your <laughs> earlier revelation of him oh, uh, wanting Russell to go down, maybe there's a little schadenfreude today from me with Bitcoin <laughs> being down, knowing that he uh, tried to go long Bitcoin futures yesterday. This way, um, is that, I, well, I did not catch that yesterday. What what Greg do with Bitcoin? For the first time in his life, he took a small short term trade uh, in Bitcoin, uh, bouncing up um, off the lows as a, like a day trade or a did he uh, multi day trade? Did he want to go back to the half to, uh, to the uh, scatter report meeting when I was talking about Coinbase? <laughs> He might want to like, is that. this is this is this a win? Do I get to put a win in my column at this? I point? think both Tyler and Matt are claiming wins. There's context here. I, and I There's, understand where this like, is coming. Uh, from. And I know some in Team Tag are like, what what's going on here? Yeah. All you need to know is look at Coinbase, and I'm going to declare short term victory. <laughs> there you go. That's right. That's right. CYN, actually, if you do want to take a peek at that here, Tyler, I've actually seen some interesting development in its chart uh, here recently, Matt. Uh, bottoming pattern rolled back up. It's a better chart than Bitcoin. You know, you, you have to easily call that uh, in the short oh, term, Tyler. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I do think Coinbase needs to be on short term watch list. This is a potential reversal. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a fight. You're just seeing the 50 day moving average play a role. But I do like the double bottom. And I do like the fact that you broke out just a couple of days ago strong out of that potential uh, triangle there as well. And so I, 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 I like it here. I, I do think it's a little overextend. Do think it has got a little bit of time before we actually confirm that reversal. But uh, yeah, I, I, I like what we're seeing on Coinbase a lot more than what I like what we're seeing on Bitcoin, quite frankly. Yeah, I think the chart's better. It just is. All right. Uh, that's what we've got from top-down analysis perspective. We're now going to go into individual company items in our stock talk segment. Uh, there's a couple of things that grab my attention in the news here today. I look at Bed Bath & Beyond, if we can. And uh, I didn't get all the raw numbers, but I saw the immediate price response. They're now giving most of it back. Uh, they missed on their earnings expectations, Matt, but they beat on revenue very slightly. They were in line uh, in, on both the numbers pretty much, but they boosted full year guidance. And the CEO is now talking about a transformation, a reformation of Bed Bath & Beyond, who's been a beleaguered company for many years, Tyler, even potentially threatening bankruptcy, I believe. Uh, Tyler, is there anything here when you see a response or a candle like that that gets you interested in the technical response any interest in BBBY here, post earnings? Well, this this seems to get caught up in the meme stock stuff, right? Like January when everything was going crazy, this goes crazy. Because um, remember retail, yes, GameStop, yes, AMC, but, but some of the retail companies too that have been high short interest have been targets for the whole Reddit crowd. I feel like that maybe gives this a little more fuel when you get any kind of spark. Um, but it's short lived, right? It's like, I mean, what's the play here? This is a massive candle. Unless you're, you know, playing this on a a, a minute time frame, I I would just stay away. This is this goes in the too hard bucket for me to go from thirty to forty back to thirty three. 
dude. I, I don't, I don't have it. I don't how to have a good time. I don't need bed, bath and beyond to have a good time. <laughs> Easier uh, ways to do it. The other, the other thing on a fundamental level, have you ever gone to bed, bath and beyond and enjoyed your shopping experience? Cause I, have. I can't remember the last time I was at a bed, bath and beyond, but I will say this. There are way too many breakouts happening in the marketplace to spend any more time on Bed Bath and Beyond. This is one of those meme stocks. Obviously, I, I get it. I get reminds, it. Well, it also leads into the next story here with Robinhood yeah. because it, it got swept up like GameStop you're talking about here, Tyler. GME, if you can, here next. Robinhood had to pay a $70 million fine. Uh, FINRA, the Financial Regulatory Authority, obviously, uh, they actually said based on uh, the Robinhood uh, role in everything that happened throughout the year, uh, $57 million in penalty, $12.6 million in restitution to harmed customers that it had. Some of these meme stocks that got all swept up into it, I don't know how much Robinhood has made this year. $70 million seems like a lot from a FINRA perspective because it's the biggest uh, fine they've ever issued from their agency, but it doesn't seem like a lot based on what has actually uh, impacted the market there. Uh, Robin Hood slap on the wrist there today, Matt. I don't know if you even saw that news, but I thought it was interesting that we're finally seeing some of that fallout from the earlier volatility and stuff. It's gonna, it, it, that's a long story to tell, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to take years to tell it, quite frankly. Yeah, it'll play itself out over a long period of time. Uh, all right, next one here, Microsoft and AT&T actually announced that they're going to be carrying the Microsoft components, that's my old mom calling, uh, on its 5G network, a big cloud computing contract for AT&T. One thing that was interesting about this one, Microsoft is such a, just a bullish, beautiful company. We talk about 1A, 1B all the time. This stock is right up near the all-time highs. I saw this news today, Tyler, and I instantly went to AT&T because AT&T is one of the big beneficiaries of this. They're going to get a lot of revenue from this as well. And at and didn't even budge on the news. In fact, it's just down here stuck in the mud doing nothing. I guess dividend analysis is the only thing. Uh, Tyler, uh, you know, anything in either of these two companies grabbing your attention, Microsoft's beautiful trend. Uh, I know that you do actually play some dividend companies, you know, when they're down near the bottoms at times. Do you have any interest in at and down here on the floor? No. Yeah, me neither. There's so many... We talked about AT&T with that news they had where they're splitting off and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I I don't know. It, it bugs me. And maybe this is because I have an ego, but it bugs me when somebody takes what could be a, a decent business model and they try to get overly creative and they screw it up. It's like AT&T, look at Verizon. All you had to do was just not touch your telecom crap. Just, you, you could have been fine. No, somebody got creative. They had this idea and that idea. So whatever, screw AT&T, AT I don't like them. Well, and it tells me a little, you know, a lot about the company, actually. When good news, you get a contract with Microsoft, you get these headlines coming in, doesn't even budge the stock. It's kind of shows you the investor sentiment sentiment that you need right there. And They're Microsoft. apathetic. To, they just don't care about AT&T right now. So why should I? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, all right. Uh, and by the way, uh, Intel, INTC, uh, let's take a last peek at this one. Last story from me. Uh, one of the beneficiaries of this news was AMD, but Intel delayed production of some of their server chips through the Xeon server, Z-X-E-O-N. I had to look up what that was when I read through this news. And uh, Intel, just more delays in production, more problems there. We saw the strength in semiconductors outside the rest of the industry it is not in Intel right now. It is in a lot of the other names. Just wanted to kind of highlight that. And that's well, there's it. a reason too, Tim, that you you reward strength and you shun weakness, right? I mean, why why try to bottom fish in the crappy ones in the semiconductors when there are so many fantastic relative strength type charts out there, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. All right, guys, uh, that's all I got from the news on a pretty light day, actually. Let's move right into our last segment here in Jedi Options. And uh, Tyler, I'm excited for this one for a couple of different reasons. Number one, I love the company you're going to highlight. Uh, it is on the Tackle 25 fundamentally strong list of uh, you know stocks that you can do cover calls on uh, that our pro members use all the time for their watch list for cover call trading and naked put trading, uh, as well as an industry that I think is picking up here recently in the solar industry. So what you got? today here for uh, Jedi Options, Tyler? Yeah, so we highlighted, I'll cut to the chase here. So so Canadian Solar uh, was on the options report this past week. And if you back it up a step though, and you say, okay, so what's what's going on with solar? Like where, you know, what, what do I need to know about the solar uh, industry from a trading perspective? And you know, a couple of things. Number one, uh, it's a growth play, right? Solar stocks are part of the growth complex. When investors are putting money into more, uh, 
let's say more aggressive stocks, stocks that have higher volatility, stocks that have more growth potential, stocks that maybe don't have as good fundamentals right now, but they got good, good prospects for the future. Solar kind of plays in that sandbox. And so you, the backdrop you want to have favorable price action, and I think a good story, a good theme for solar is growth stocks leading, which we have been talking about all day today. The NASDAQ being at all time highs helps this. Uh, chip stocks making a comeback helps this. Um, and just a general bullish sentiment uh, in the marketplace helps solar. These guys also remember um, the Democrats uh, sweeping Congress, uh, taking the, the presidency, right? Democrats generally are viewed as, as pro um, a pro, what's the word I'm thinking of? Solar power, right? Pro uh, alternative energy, alternative you know, energy. There we go. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so they, you know, so, so you've also got that kind of tailwind on, on the back of this. But, but as is often the case, Wall Street gets a little bit giddy, too far out over their skis. And they're like, all right, well, let's take Canadian from 10 bucks to 65. And, and when you get that type of growth in, in the, and particularly like post November, after the presidential election, it goes from 40 to 65. Would you would you see valuations get that stretched when your multiples are that high? You are subject to some rude awakenings when reality doesn't prove as as uh, you know as as optimistic and as good as was priced in. So you get you got you got a comeuppance in Canadian solar. It went from 67 back down to 35. Basically a 50% haircut, Tim. Um, and I suspect, you know, if you had ridden the wave up, you probably weren't very happy about that. But the, the question for those that aren't in it is, when do I get interested? And the answer is when the trend starts to show stability, when we start to see bottoming patterns emerge. And ultimately, can it, I mean, look, this is messy, 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 not much going on here until recently, until recently. Um, we you really hadn't mentioned solar at all, I think on the bullish uh, scouting reports um, for obvious reasons, until finally, as is often the case, sellers wash out, you, you get some subtle changes in character, it stabilizes, and this is essentially what it looks like coming into this week. And now you can map out a bullish trade. You, you can map out, hey, I got a little ascending triangle here, maybe a little uh, sideways trading range, if you will popped above the 50-day moving average on Friday with above average volume, right? Raises an eyebrow, you perk up, you say, okay, you know, this is percolating, things are going on here, let's pay attention. That's what got it on the report this week. And the thing is, you don't know what's going to happen, but you put yourself in enough spots, enough good spots, where usually every once in a while you get paid. Here's a situation where Canadian solar is like, look, let's do this. And you got a massive pop. You got a massive pop, um, and it's just it's just a delight when the chart does what you would expect it to do. When it rewards you for finding a nice little bottoming pattern, you, you nailed it the day before the breakout. It's always good when you wake up on one Monday, Tim, and you look like a genius because the stock that was on the reports up ten percent. So, you know that's the technical analysis. You've got a bottom. The daily chart is now above all major moving averages. I find this interesting. And, and the question you ask yourself is, do you think that was one and done? Do you think that was it? They love solar for, for a couple of bars and it's gonna crumble and go right back into a downtrend. Could happen. Or do you think this reversal was legit and that the sentiment has changed enough where there is more to come? If that is the, the uh, premise, if that's what you believe, then you are interested in secondary patterns. You are interested in the next setup because you really didn't want to chase this yesterday anyways, because it had gone up too far too fast. So what interests me is this uh, little pullback here. I don't know if it's going to be a one bar pullback or a two bar pullback or a three bar pullback. All I know is this breakout was legit. Institutions were piling in. I think it is a breakout that sticks, which means I'm a buyer of the next dip. And I want to get prepped for it today in the event that it doesn't pull back any further, right? Because uh, if I don't and I say, oh, it's got to pull back four days or something and then it rips tomorrow, I miss it again. So you, you got to be anticipatory here in terms of mapping out trades. So that's the setup. I'm now going to go through comparing two different option trades. But any any uh, comments on the setup, Tim? 
No, no. In fact, I appreciate that you ran through that. Obviously, we had this on the option report over the weekend, and uh, it did end up following through. We don't expect that kind of price movement, obviously, on a Monday. We were just anticipating the breakout. Now it's carried through. So it's kind of left us in a position. So now how do I trade it, right? Which is why I think it's a perfect candidate for Jedi options today, because uh, it may not be the best uh, just straight delta trade after the rip. Uh, there might be some other you know, more creative ways to play it. So I'm really just interested to see how, uh, how you're going to draw those two things up. Yeah. So the, what I'm going to compare with these two option trades is going to give you a choice of, do you want, and this is often the choice, right? This is often the choice that you have with, with, with building an option strategy. A, do you want a high probability cash flow play that's going to pay out as long as this doesn't completely implode? Or B, do you want to do the type of trade where if you get another Monday and the thing rips 10%, you're really going to have a rich reward? right? And so you take your pick. And in choosing these two, I think they're both good options. Otherwise, I wouldn't present them. So I don't have a super strong opinion. In a situation like this, one thing that helps me make the choice is what do I already have in my portfolio, right? And we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. But let's, let's go trade number one is a bull put spread, $45 stock, now you say, well, how's the volatility? How's the, are the options expensive? Are they cheap? Well, the thing about Canadian solar is the, the volatility, the, the actual volatility that's priced into options is quite a bit on balance because Canadian solar is a volatile stock. So in general, month to month to month, there's always premium available in the options. This is not AT&T, uh, this is not Verizon. Th there's always premium available. So even though, you could argue that we're in the lower quartile of the one-year range. The, the rank is not particularly high. It doesn't matter. There's still plenty of premium in the options. So I was looking at how far out of the money can I go and sell a bull put spread or a naked put uh, and, and get a decent premium. And looking at the chart, well, I'd certainly like to be below the breakout area because that way, if it comes back and retests 41, I don't get shaken out and give that the chance to become support. But quite honestly, I'd also like to be below the low of the base that preceded the breakout because you'd really have to crumble to then get knocked out if you use your strike price as your stop loss. So something around 38, 37 or below would be nice. So I go to the trade tab. I don't have enough time in July. I prefer not to use the weeklies if I can avoid it because of liquidity. I think 51 days is perfectly fine. So I'm gonna to go to August and I'm just gonna kind of go right towards those strikes I was looking at based on the chart. I'm gonna go with 37. This has a 15 Delta, which gives me an 85% probability of profit. There's the high probability I referenced. I'm gonna sell that. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a credit spread just to make it limited risk. I like to do maybe a $5 wide. So I sold the 37 put, I'm gonna buy the 32 to protect myself. And that gives me about 57 cents credit to make the math easy. I'm just going to make it 60 and assume I can get filled at that. But I need at least 50 cents. 57 is plenty. 60 is fine. So I can get a good enough return. Good enough meaning you're making 60 bucks on 410, which is, well, I can't do that in my head. Actually, hang on. It would not. Why is it 410? It should not be 410. Should be 440. I don't know why that BB is there. It should be 440. At 60 bucks on 440, you're making over a 13% return. And if I look at the chart, I mean, here's how I would size it up. I would say, look, do you think Canadian solar stays above 37? You do. If you if you believe the breakout, this should not be below 37 in uh, in a month. Um, are you willing to make the bet that it stays above 37 in exchange for a 13 and a half percent return? Uh, you know, with a 15 Delta, which knowing what I now know about Royd, I know selling a 15 Delta credit spread and getting a 13, almost 14% return translates into a good enough Royd, uh, unless I'm mistaken. So that's trade number one. Any feedback on that one? Well, you know, I like a couple of the components here. If you go back to the option chain and uh, how you had that built, you know, going with the put side of it uh, and building that credit out through the August, 
Uh, as I'm looking at the numbers here, the ROID would probably be in line with what I need, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, the timeline on that trade, 51 days, is still in the wheelhouse of getting a theta trade to actually benefit from that time decay curve in a very positive way. So I think it's just properly built. Uh, there's nothing wrong with this one at all. I like it. So it's going to be interesting to cross compare it against uh, your second choice because you can always just go chalk here and play that vertical. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as far as the timing goes, I, honestly, I, I find today a little bit of a tricky candle to try to have a strong opinion on the timing. I mean, I, I would not mind this coming down another day or two. Um, you don't want a deeper retracement. Like, I probably don't want this to come down lower than maybe halfway, um, you know, the halfway point for this big breakout bar. But I don't know, maybe it does come down another day. Uh, it, it's just tough because it's kind of a doge, right? So I'm a little ambivalent on, on the optimal timing as the when to pull the trigger. But, but see, here's the kicker. If I pulled the trigger today, Tim, I feel like I have a wide enough range. Like I'm far enough out of the money to where I, I wouldn't be too concerned if I jumped the gun anyways, uh, if it did pull back into the bar or two. But mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the logical then comparison or alternative would be something more directional, right? Something that gives you a little more, more juice if this thing uh, pops. And I don't know that I need to be overly clever with this. Um, I, I, buying calls is a little bit tough for me, Tim, because the, the implied vol at 64%, I mean, calls are pretty pricey. Um, and so I can get a really good spread going just by buying the 45 strike call and then selling the 50 against it. You know, kind of shooting for 50 as your, your, uh, your upside target, which I think is completely doable given that that's major resistance up there. So, um, I, I also think that 51 days provides me ample time. I, I don't know that I really want to jump to September or October because mm -hmm. uh, I think you're going to get resolution in the next couple of weeks anyways, one way or the other. And so I don't want all the extra time to make the trade take too long. So I'm going to stick with August. Just again, this is to me a simple structure here. This is a bull call spread, bull call vertical, buying the AUG 45, about a 57 delta, and then again, I'm just going to stick with a $5 wide spread. I'm going to sell the AUG 50. And check this out, Tim. I, I don't know that you would have guessed that this was only going to be $1.85 for a $5 spread. That is quite cheap. It's quite cheap. I'm risking a buck 85 to make $3.15. So that's a lot. It's a potential 170% return. Right, like take that, you 13.6% potential return on the put spread, like, like not even close. Mm -hmm. So you, you definitely have some explosive potential profit. Um, the net delta 56 minus 39. I mean, you're, you're close to, you're almost around a 20, 20 net delta, good enough. Um, it's just a cheap trade, man. It's a cheap upside bet. You take a look at the risk graph, you know, risking a little to make a lot. Um, and you're not asking for much. I mean, if it gets to 50 pretty quick, you know, you made about a 50% return and you're just waiting for time to to make the, uh, the rest of it. Interesting couple of choices here. Let me think through this a little bit here, Ty. So the bull put, my credit was 60, right? Yes. 50 days, you know, um, I don't have an earnings in that cycle. I don't believe at least, uh, you know, the earnings would be right at the back end of the August ex expiration, if anywhere, uh, yep. but it would be most of the 50 days. I wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, I'm down below some major levels, you know, so it would have to violate the breakout zone to come back and violate my trade uh, to go in the money and force me to exit and take a loss. Uh, it would have to violate the moving averages, you know, a lot of that kind of thing. I have to see a pretty good sell off on a trend that's now developing. So I like this side of it from a directional perspective uh, in general, because I love breakouts. But when you're a little bit stretched here, I might take the cushion there. The advantage, obviously, on the bull call is you've got the reward to risk that's going to line up in your favor. The only hesitation I have on the bull call is uh, just the, the, the fact that we only have the 51 days and I'm going to be working negative time decay on that during mm -hmm. some of the cycle there because of quite frankly, I'm long the option at 45. That has a higher theta rate than the short option at 50 is going to offset for me. So in my opinion, out of the two different scenarios and the way to play it, 
I would lean on the bull put side of it uh, because I really like the cushion here. I like the fact that if I'm wrong, it has to break below a lot of different areas that could play defense for me. Old yep. breakout channel at 41. Old support level as well. Moving averages. And it'd have to break character in the current move that it's in, which has had a nice volume spike to drive it higher. So for me here, I would lean bull put out of the two different choices. You might be able to get me on a bull call if the technical setup felt like a better entry point today, right? Yep. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I'm leaning bull put. That's where I would probably uh, side on, on the discussion. What about well, you? It, well, and I think... I think that the bull, I'm with you, the bull call, I think would be an easier play if let's say you get one more red bar or two more red bars, small red bars, then mm -hmm. you get a nice little trigger. Cause then you could maybe instead of doing 45, 50, maybe you're doing like 43, 48 bull call or something. Um, so yes, I think that the, the, I agree with you. I would take the bull put and it's arguably because we might need just a touch more time, a, a more candle or two for the bull call to really be a cleaner uh, entry. Just because you don't want to throw the bull call on right now and then have to sit through a three bar drop. It's just too much drama. So a little bit, I think if you have more confidence on the timing, it's easier to pull the trigger on the directional trade versus the theta play. Um, so I would go with the bull, but here as well. Matty, welcome back, first of all. Thank and, uh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking bull put versus bull call on CSIQ. Mm -hmm. Tyler mapped them out beautifully. And a couple of interesting ideas. I wouldn't fault somebody for going with the delta play here, but I kind of leaned on the theta play uh, myself. But, I know that this is one of your favorite companies in this space and a uh, good fundamentally sound company. What's your instinct? Company. Yeah. yeah, great company. Yeah, I, I had an internet spike and had to reset the computer. So I missed, I, I caught the very first of... Hey, let's talk. Uh, let's talk CSIQ, and then I got back with, "Hey, but I like this," and so I missed everything. Everything besides the first word and the last word. But I'll I'll just approach it. So I don't know the parameters you guys were dealing with the uh, delta you were selling. The, I, all of those are within the parameters of a of a good trade. Number one, mm -hmm. we're talking about CSIQ, and it's good cash flow stock in general. I look at this very similar to what you guys were talking about at the very end of it from a technical perspective. And, and I caught some of Tyler's, you know, if I had two more bars down, maybe the bull call at that point. And I agree with that. You like that. You like the volume that you like the price movement. You like the reclaiming of moving averages. You like a lot about the directional nature of CSIQ. What you don't like is the immediate zone of support it is in regarding regarding that pullback. You certainly could see some consolidation where the 200-day moving average is. You certainly could see a little bit of a bigger pullback here. And because of those two things, you could see some consolidation as it fights for defense after a really aggressive move that it just made or maybe give me a little bit of a deeper pullback so we can reset that real good move it just made. In either case, if you're looking to do something immediate, you're in wait and see mode on that bull call spread, in my opinion. You're in the zone based on the fact that you just broke out, you reclaimed the moving averages, you got a good price movement, you got volume to support it. CSIQ solar in general is tied to, it's tied loosely to uh, to the innovation uh, that these uh, that drives the arc index in general but you also have some growth here as well uh, that it's tied to and so you gotta like the zone you just don't like that support that it's that right now and you don't like the trigger right now and because of that I do fade to the uh, I fade the bull call I, I gravitate towards the bull put spread here Absolutely. That's kind of where my instinct was as well for a lot of those different reasons. So uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, that analysis. Did I, Tyler, did I confirm and, you guys? Is that what um, I did? Kind of. I mean, I just really like this company. Maybe I would play it either way, by the way. Jim's I, like, what do you want to do? Cover calls, naked puss, bull puss, bull calls. I got, I got them all. Uh, I, I'm like, I'm like the guy talking <laughs> shrimp off for scum. That's how much Tim likes Canadian solar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'll be honest. I'm also thinking long equity here at some point. So I think there's option opportunities. I think long there's equity, equity opportunities. Yeah. Maybe a horizontal, maybe a diagonal. More like an investment. You know, maybe. I, I, I yeah. don't have a piece maybe of CSIQ just, yet. Yeah. 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 So 
I'm interested. I, I like was literally just going to throw out every <laughs> bowl going every strategy. strategy. Just pull out the like, the strategy like, playbook and list them all. I'll be like, okay, yep, 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 yep. It, yep. <laughs> Apparently, we're putting CSIQ into CRM's it's, category. It's in the for Hall Jim. of Fame. It's in the Hall of Fame already. Yeah. Oh, I better back that back off. Yeah, that you just back that hair. truck off. Back off that just air confirmation bias. All right, guys, uh, that's it uh, here today for our show. We're going to start wrapping up, talking uh, final thoughts as well as uh, you know, Tyler, you're promoting. Uh, your very first trading lab here today. Team Phoenix will be meeting in about an hour and a half, 90 minutes from now. Uh, Coach Mark has joined us. He's going to give you any information you guys need out there. If you're a part I of trading literally, labs. I, I must be living right because my two brothers don't make me laugh very often, but holy cow, did I just chuckle deep in my soul. I walk into Matt on the, on the forest joke, uh, shrimp joke. I, <laughs> that was funny. Thank you, brother. That's good. Uh, I just feel like I'm living right. You know, I got, uh, <laughs> I wish I could have remembered his name. <laughs> I couldn't remember the character's name. Bubba Gump? It, Bubba? it was Bubba Gump Shrimp. Bubba. But it, yeah. in the moment, like it, it was off the cuff in the moment you forget. Yeah. I love We Bubba. got some bull puts. We got some <laughs> bull calls. We got some diagonals. <laughs> we got some inverted butterflies. <laughs> Keep going, bro. <laughs> yeah, no, hey, listen, I'll keep going, but I will keep going. Listen, we got no shortage of things going on at Tackle Trading today. Mr. Tyler Craig, and listen, if you're a student in Tyler's lab, uh, you should have gotten not one, but two emails from me this week already talking about uh, where to find it. But if you still don't know where to find it, uh, you can always email me. Uh, but Tyler will be holding his lab in one and a half in 90 minutes. I'll let him promote that a little bit uh, more here in a second. Uh, but we also got Trade Masters tonight where we got more. I got too much Tyler Craig on my schedule today because I got t- Tyler on Trade Masters today, too. And Greg Holmes doing a mind of a trader tonight. Lots going on at Tackle Trading, to say the least, but excited for the programming throughout the day. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Tyler, let's get your final thoughts on the market. Then we talk a little bit about your lab, but uh, yep. I'll, and I want to make sure people know where and how to find that. If you're in Team Phoenix, that goes live here in 90 minutes. But Tyler, any last thoughts on the market itself uh, before we wrap completely up? Honestly, no. Yeah. Doji, end of the quarter. Great first half of the year. And apparently I need to rewatch Forrest Gump, uh, Matt. <laughs> Dude, that scene is an amazing. It's a, That's a got rewatch. some naked puts. Uh-huh. Got some in the money calls. Fry got em. the poor boys train. Boil them. <laughs> <Boil 'em. laughs> <laughs> All right. Stop All right. loss. Stop All right. loss. We just stop stopped out. out. We stop just stopped out. out. Tyler. Um, Final thoughts very quickly are the exact same as Tyler's. I swear to heaven, it's Doji Wednesday every single Wednesday. Uh, hump day is a Doji day. It just is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind it. I, I don't mind light market new uh, activity in the middle of the summer. Hey, it, at the yeah, end of hey the listen. It's like Tyler said at the very beginning of the show, though. Those Doji quarter point up, quarter point up, they add up to that 16% that happened in the first uh, half of the year. And it doesn't, in the moment of time, it's like, oh my goodness, just do something already. Well, guys, the market did something. Best go, best first half in 20 years. Open question, can it continue? The technical analysis support it. Stay with us every day as we break it down, guys. That's why you come to the halftime report, though. Uh, Team Tackle, love you guys. Get excited for those trading labs. Tyler has his coming up very, very shortly. We had our first one on Monday with Coach M. And as, uh, you know, we launched anything, we we had some issues with some links. We'll get those figured out, guys. And I am looking forward to these uh, trading labs. Emily was a rock star. Now we got Tyler round two coming up today. Coach Mark tomorrow night. Get excited, guys. Trading labs are going to be a thing attack training for a very long time. And you can access Tyler's lab, which goes live at 3 p.m. Eastern here today in 90 minutes, right from the events page at Tackle Trading. You can also find his lab under the shows tab. Uh, If you go to the shows trading labs, you'll find Team Phoenix right there. And then you can enter the webinar room right there if you are a member of Team Phoenix. And if you're not yet, guys, all the information you need is right on the store tab. There's a bunch of different resource links in there, as well as uh, the ability to sign up for a 15-day trial for those labs. And Tyler, just give us a preview. What are you going to be doing today? Uh, with your team yeah i'm going to be laying out the first i think the first couple sessions i am going to essentially break down all the uh the trading principles that i use the trading strategies that i use you're going to be able to to take a peek 
into the mind of Coach Tyler and see uh, exactly how I trade, the types of, of uh, systems that I use, and some of the philosophy behind why I do what I do. And so uh, I suspect these first couple of sessions will be pinned at the top of my page so that all future attendees will be able to view them. So this will lay the groundwork for some successful uh, team meetings every week from here on out. And I got a very good trade idea that it's gonna that I'm gonna analyze uh, in the class today. Very cool. Yeah, enjoy it. Have a lot of fun with it. And out there, if you're members, uh, make sure that uh, you, you get in there and participate and dive in and pick Tyler's brain. So looking forward to watching that uh, here in a little bit. All right, guys, we're done for today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We do have Trade Masters tonight here on YouTube, 7 p.m. Eastern. Come and join us live. Coach Mark's going to be hosting that as always, one of our favorite programs of the week. But until then, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday, guys. Uh, see you guys.